Hello, Drew Grimers. How are you? Stop. I can't hear you. Stop. I don't, I can't hear what you're saying. Well, it's that time again, that rare, rare, rare occasion when I post a compilation video from my TikTok page. This is such an unusual thing for me to do. So here it is, you know. This is another uh, compilation of uh, worst freak accidents. Um, I gotta be honest, I may have lost track of videos I may have already used. And I, I go through like the older ones just to see to make sure I'm not repeating any videos. But I don't know if I've repeated videos in, in multiple playlists. If I have, I'm sorry. Just enjoy that video again. Uh, I didn't really put together a, uh, a good process for remembering uh, what I've already done in compilations. In the very few compilations that I've even done, <laughs> you know? So without further ado, here's like, I don't know, 20 or 90, I don't know, videos of uh, Worst Freak Accidents. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. On a cold Friday the 13th in 2012, a horrible disaster would occur. Hello, true crimers. This is the story of the Costa Concordia disaster. Viewer discretion is advised. The Costa Concordia was a massive luxury liner. It first set sail in 2005. It was about 951 feet long, which was longer than the Titanic. It could also hold 3,780 passengers on top of the crew. On January 13th, 2012, it would depart from the city of Civitavecchia, which is in Italy. It left at 7.18 p.m., and by a couple hours later, it was near Giglio Island, which would be this little island right there. Now, they were trying to go past the island to do a maritime salute, which was normal. Underneath, there were some rock formations that they were starting to notice. Captain Scatino, who had been a captain for about seven years, he ordered the ship to go one direction, but apparently due to a language barrier, it went the other direction. This is supposedly because the helmsman was Indonesian, so there was a language barrier. At 9.45 p.m., the boat's stern, while the ship was trying to move away, struck and connected with the reef below. It created a 174-foot tear on the ship. Five compartments, and also including the engine room, began to take on water. Now, when this happened, passengers obviously felt it, and they also heard a very loud crack. But according to witnesses, a lot of the staff was going around saying, everything's fine, go back to your staterooms. And then they started to order people to wear their life vests. The goal was they were trying to reduce the panicking, but to do so, they lied. And somewhere around 10.14, the ship began to list to one side. The ship's captain, Scatino, he was still downplaying what was happening, even though the ship was literally going to one side. Then the blackout happened. By 10.39 p.m., they finally acknowledged out loud, okay, yeah, we need to abandon ship now. By the way, the captain, Scatino, he just ordered tugboats to come at this point, not rescuers. Because of how the ship was listing to one side, it was very difficult to launch uh, lifeboats. So they had to use like a rope to have people like get down from the side of the ship. At 11.20 p.m., the few lifeboats that were able to launch, the captain literally abandoned ship and got on a lifeboat claiming he fell in. When he was ordered back to the ship by another crew member, he said no. Ultimately, 32 people lost their lives that night. This is just some of them. There were obviously a ton of injuries, but mostly everyone survived. The captain was charged with manslaughter, and he was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Look at this damage. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 40. Hello, true crimers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a bin lorry, and when I first was recommended this story, I had to look that up because I had no idea what that was. It's a garbage truck, or a rubbish truck. But in Glasgow, Scotland, it is called a bin lorry. 
On the afternoon of December 22nd, 2014, on Queen Street in Glasgow, Scotland, a bin lorry that was being driven by a man by the name of Harry Clark and two passengers behind him, they had just driven past the lights at the Gallery of Modern Art when 58-year-old driver Harry Clark blacked out. The two passengers behind him, his fellow co-workers, were seatbelts in and they could not reach the emergency brake. For 19 seconds, the bin lorry traveled down the pavement and at one point it actually accelerated to about 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers per hour, where unfortunately it would clip a car and then it drove into a group of pedestrians who were trying to get out of the way. It would strike a wall and then it would finally come to a stop when it got basically jammed inside of an alley's entryway. The bin lorry would strike 21 people. Six of those people would die. Three of them were actually from the same family. Erin McQuaid and her grandparents, Jack Sweeney and Lorraine Sweeney. The others were Stephanie Tate, Jacqueline Morton, and Jillian Ewing. From here, it would come down to who is to blame. Obviously, the first person they would go to is the driver of the vehicle. Why did he black out? Now, the two passengers in the bin lorry, they kind of walked away unscathed. But the driver, Harry Clark, he would suffer some injuries and he was in the hospital for a couple of days. He had a history of blackouts. He had a history of dizziness and fainting spells. Now, this had actually been going on with him since the 1970s. Now, in their investigation, they would find out that Mr. Clark withheld a lot of this information either from his own doctors or from the companies who hired him. He actually blacked out driving another vehicle back in 2010 where no one was hurt, but they had to determine, was this criminal intent? They ultimately concluded with no. Now, there were no faults with the truck itself, so that was ruled out. If he had disclosed his medical information from the 2010 incident, he actually still would have gotten his license back to drive these vehicles, which means he still would have been operating this vehicle regardless. Ultimately, though, he was suspended for not disclosing the information, and there were no settlements. Freak accidents happen all the time. This story, to me, is like the definition of what a freak accident is. Hello, true crimeers. This is another worst freak accidents, and it is the story of Umberto Hernandez. Viewer discretion is advised. On June 21st, 2007, 24 year old Umberto Hernandez was walking down a sidewalk with his wife in Oakland, California, and a one in a billion thing occurred. A vehicle had swerved off the road and ran directly into a fire hydrant. After the collision, the fire hydrant shot up into the air. And because of the high intensity water pressure, it shot up as fast as a bullet. The 200 pound iron fire hydrant then came catapulting towards the ground. And it then struck 24 year old Umberto Hernandez in the back of the head. The hydrant struck him so hard that it then went 20 feet in the other direction and it hit a fence. Umberto collapsed and he was pronounced dead at the scene. His wife was not even touched. The odds of this happening, I mean, experts who analyzed this case said if he had just been one step ahead or one step back, it never would have hit him. To me, it's insane to think what could have happened or what could not have happened had maybe you leave your house 30 seconds earlier, 30 seconds later. How often do we avoid scenarios like this because of one last minute decision? Like I said, he was pronounced dead at the scene. I do not know if they said he died immediately or if he was in any kind of pain, but I, I have to imagine a 200 pound iron fire hydrant striking you that fast in the back of the head it would probably be an immediate thing, at least I hope. And I for one hope he is resting in peace. Molasses is 40% more dense than water. So imagine a 25 foot wave of it coming towards you. 
Hello, True Kramers. This is another Worst Freak Accidents, and this one's called The Great Boston Molasses Flood. Viewer discretion is advised. Molasses is a thick, goopy substance, and it's made by refining sugarcane, and it has a lot of different uses. Um, one of the more popular uses is actually in alcohol. Right here was the Purity Distilling Company factory, and it was located in the north end of Boston. Get in the car! No. So this was a company that made alcohol. And right here was a massive tank filled to the brim with molasses. On January 15th, 1919, the lower half or so was filled with cooled down molasses. The upper portion was filled with recently added warm molasses from a shipment. The temperatures that day were beginning to steadily rise, so it was about 40 degrees that day. The tank was roughly 50 feet tall, and it had 2.3 million gallons of molasses. At 12.30 p.m. on January 15, 1919, the tank ruptured and essentially exploded open. It would send giant rivets that were holding the tank together just flying into the open area. People reported it sounded almost like gunfire. I, I gotta ask, do you think those cars had a horn that went, Auga! Yeah, probably. Once the tank ripped open, a 25-foot wave of molasses came pouring out. It would travel at roughly 35 to 40 miles per hour. And again, it's 40% more dense than water. So a flood of water can already take out homes and buildings. Imagine what molasses does. People try to flee, but the wave would essentially push people and throw them. Other people got swallowed up by the molasses and they couldn't get out. And they would end up drowning in this super thick substance. There were vehicles being picked up and thrown, and people were being hit by them. Not to mention all the other debris that was just flying around. For the others who got stuck in the molasses but not up to their head, they said it was extremely difficult to move out of it or to move their body at all. They were literally trapped in it. When everything was over, 150 people were seriously injured and 21 people died. There were several horses who died as well, and the entire area was just destroyed. The Skyway Bridge is down. This is a mayday. This is an emergency situation. Stop the traffic on the Skyway Bridge. Hello, True Crimers. This is another Worst Freak Accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This was the Bob Graham Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida, and it was located near St. Petersburg. It's about four miles long. It stands about 430 feet tall. It consists of four lanes, and the drop from the road down is about 180 feet. On May 9th, 1980, at approximately 7.38 a.m., disaster would strike. There was a storm that morning that temporarily blinded a freighter, a freighter named the MV Summit Venture. Because of the blinding, they would crash into one of the support columns of the bridge and this would cause about 1,200 feet of road to crash down to the waters below. On the bridge at the time were six cars, a truck, and a Greyhound bus. The entire thing happened within minutes. No one on the bridge at that time stood a chance. Because of the disaster, 35 people would lose their lives. There was only one survivor, and that survivor was Wesley McIntyre. He kind of almost had his own second freak accident. His pickup truck fell off the bridge and landed on the hull of the freighter. It then ricocheted and bounced into the water. And then the truck sank, but he was able to get out of it. This is perhaps the most famous image of the disaster. This vehicle belonged to a man named Richard Hornbuckle. And in an unbelievable moment of luck, he was able to slam on the brakes and literally Inches from the drop, the car stopped. A mayday was immediately called in once this happened. Rescuers were there within moments. And of course, an investigation would go forth. The storm that happened that morning was actually not forecasted. 
there were 60 mile an hour winds that factored into the freighter having to maneuver a little bit differently. And then the extremely low visibility, you know, it was, it was just very difficult to place blame on the captain of that vessel. That being said, because the captain is responsible for his vessel and safe navigation, a court did find that he and his crew were responsible for the accident. There were several wrongful death lawsuits filed against the captain. There was hundreds of millions of dollars of lawsuits filed. And there were several settlements, I don't know how many, but the average settlement to each victim's family was about $300,000. And the owners of the Summit Venture, they had to pay the state of Florida about $19 million. The Skyway Bridge has since been rebuilt with new safety features. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 36. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 30-year-old Dwayne Weston, who was originally from Sydney, Australia. He was a thrill seeker and a world champion base jumper. He's also known to have created some new and unique base jumping techniques that many base jumpers to this day still use. Dwayne was a pioneer. But tragically, his life would be cut short on October 5th, 2003 in Colorado. Pictured here is the Royal Gorge Bridge, which is in Cannon City, Colorado. At 955 feet above the Arkansas River, it stands as one of the world's highest bridges. And it would be here at this exact location where Dwayne Weston would perform his final stunt. October 5th, 2003 was the inaugural Go Fast Games. And the plan was that Dwayne, wearing a wingsuit, would fly over the bridge while his partner uh, would go under the bridge. Just before the jump, he would tell Corliss, just remember, whatever happens, happens. This is not an image of the actual jump, but this is a wingsuit. Dwayne would jump off from the starting point and he would get up to 120 miles per hour. Now, because they miscalculated some things, including the wind and wind speed, something tragic would happen. At 120 miles per hour, Dwayne would strike the bridge and his leg would be severed completely off. There were onlookers and people recording this event and it still wasn't finished for Dwayne. After his leg was severed, his parachute would be deployed, but he would end up falling. He fell 300 feet and landed on boulders below. Before any type of rescue could even get to him, Dwayne Weston would bleed to death. I understand that people love this stuff and there are plenty of people out there like Dwayne. And honestly, more power to him. I know this is something that doesn't happen all that often, but damn, I guess it's one hell of a way to go. This is a worst freak accident that's also shrouded in mystery, controversy, and even ghosts. Hello, true crimeers. This is the story of the Manila Film Center incident. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here is Imelda Marcos, who was the first lady of the Philippines for some time. And this was her husband, Ferdinand. Now, something that Imelda wanted to do was she wanted to host an international film festival. And she had this vision of a theater to do it in. And she did not want to waste any time. They had a budget of about $25 million to get this theater up and running. And boy, was she ambitious. 4,000 laborers were hired to build this thing. They would work three different shifts across 24 hours. And this is a project that should have taken months at least, but she wanted it done in weeks. During the rushed construction process on November 17th, 1981, at approximately three o'clock in the morning, the witching hour, there was a disaster. A scaffolding on the third floor collapsed and there were hundreds of workers working on that scaffolding and they all went tumbling towards the ground. Now, at that point, this is when it becomes a controversy and mystery. So one of the confirmed parts of the story is that several of the workers fell and they were impaled on the vertical steel bars below, something directly out of a horror movie. There was also some rubble that came with this and there were reports that several men were trapped in the rubble. 
and what's rumored to be over a hundred men had fallen into quick drying cement below that had just been laid down. Several of these men had reportedly been buried alive underneath the cement. Some men were buried only halfway up and then the cement dried around them. There was a story of a worker who was trapped up to the waist in cement and people were there to keep him company, but eventually by the time they were able to get him out, he had already passed. The controversy is that Imelda was so concerned about this theater being finished, she didn't even allow anyone to enter the building after the incident for over 10 hours. And then they tried to pass it off as if only seven people died. But it is widely believed that she had over 100 men permanently buried underneath the cement and they just covered them up. Her project manager, Betty Benitez, she had no choice but to fulfill her order. And then a few months later, Betty Benitez dies in a freak accident. The exact amount of deaths has never been confirmed, but now it is considered to be Manila's most haunted building. At one point, they even had to have the building exercised, but that did not appear to work. Just think of all the pissed off spirits that are there. The building was rushed and finished, and it's still operating today. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 41. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was five-year-old Charlie Holt of Charlotte, North Carolina. On April 14th, 2017, Charlie and his parents would go to a restaurant inside this building. It was the Weston Building in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the restaurant is called The Sundial. There is a very unique feature about this restaurant, so let me show you a quick video. So that was obviously a sped up video of what the restaurant does. But the floor of the restaurant where people are actually sitting at their booths eating, it rotates very slowly. So on the afternoon of April 14th, 2017, Charlie and his family had finished their meal at the sundial. They were getting ready to pay for their meal up front. Now it's important to note that Charlie was right by his parents. There were people in the media at first who were wanting to place blame on the parents, but this situation was not their fault. Charlie was right there. But somehow, some way, Charlie managed to get his head stuck between the back of a booth and the, the wall. And again, the restaurant floor is rotating and that's essentially where his head is. So his head was stuck. And this is a recreation of people trying to disassemble the wall, people trying to pull Charlie out. One of the waiters was like front and center trying to save Charlie, as were his parents. Charlie managed to get most of his body at that point kind of stuck in a very small gap. We're talking like six or seven inches worth of gap. And his head sadly was crushed. They were able to finally free him um, from being stuck. And the young boy was rushed to the emergency room, but unfortunately he had experienced severe brain damage, and Charlie Holt passed away that day. It is also important to note that when this began, the, they were able to power off the rotating floor. So he wasn't being like dragged along, but he had gotten stuck because of the rotation before they turned it off. Both the parents and the restaurant would eventually agree that this was not the fault of the parents. The parents did nothing wrong. The parents did file a lawsuit, of course, against the restaurant, which they would end up settling with an undisclosed private amount. And of course, the restaurant was also required to take extra safety measures to make sure that this kind of thing never happens again. And the restaurant does remain open. A dense fog would roll in early one 1990 morning in Tennessee and would cause the worst freak accident, number 38. Viewer discretion is advised. There is a stretch of the I-75 near Knoxville, Tennessee that had been plagued with accidents. Now, this stretch of the 75 was near the Hawassi River, and it was near the Chickamauga Dam. Also in the area was the Bowwater Paper Mill, which is now the Resolute Forest Products. Now, the paper mill operated settling uh, ponds, which would create 
a mist of sorts. So these three factors with the river, the dam, the paper mill, and not to mention the constantly kind of changing colder weather would create issues with fog along a certain stretch of road of the I-75. Between 1974 and 1979, the fog would create six different accidents, um, and there was a grand total of six fatalities between all of them. On December 11th, 1990, it would see its most fatal accident. At approximately 9.10 in the morning on December 11th, 1990, the road appeared to be completely clear. The cars were buzzing by, everything was moving smoothly. When out of nowhere, a massive, dense blanket of fog creeped across the interstate. A semi-trailer that had a tractor with it had slowed down because the fog was creating almost no visibility. Within a moment, you couldn't see anything. And just moments after that tractor trailer stopped, another tractor trailer slammed into the back of them because they could not see them. Thankfully, both of those individuals and everyone in those vehicles were safe. And then, disaster. Then a normal compact car slammed into the back of the trailer, the second one, and then a semi-truck crashed into the back of that vehicle. This created a huge fire which spread quickly. The fire was spread across three vehicles and killed the occupants of the normal compact car within moments. Now this was all happening on the southbound lanes and then over on the northbound lanes, it was happening again. Another vehicle noticed the accident had happened so they slowed down, but then they were hit immediately by another car. And then a pickup truck slammed into that car and then boom, 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 just car after car after car just kept crashing. The fog was that dense where you literally could not see anything even above you because there was a bridge in the area and someone said when they looked up, they couldn't even see the bridge. 99 vehicles were involved in this accident. There were multiple explosions, multiple fires. So many of the vehicles involved in this were consumed completely by fire that you couldn't even recognize them after the fact. Many of the fatalities, they were so badly burned that they could not be identified visually. The survivors, the ambulance drivers, the firefighters, the cops, they were all breathing in smoke and they were unable to breathe because it was so bad. The fires were so bad that the asphalt of the road had begun to melt. The rescue operation would require over 200 rescue personnel. When the smoke and the fog settled, 12 people would lose their lives that day. And 42 others were injured so badly they had to be hospitalized, but they would pull through. Now, the investigation into this would not exactly be conclusive as to what exactly was truly at fault. Ultimately, this was caused by Mother Nature. Given the accidents that had happened before, they likely should have installed some sort of warning system, um, you know, well ahead of this accident happening, but they didn't. But the nearby river, the nearby dam, and even though they refused to claim any responsibility, the nearby paper mill were kind of all at play here. Just Mother Nature doing its worst. Now, because of this accident, they did finally install fog warning systems, and it would warn you well ahead of time near the areas that are going to be denser in fog. They also put up very large fog warning signs during the stretch of road where this is a problem. The Tennessee Department of Transportation would end up shelling out somewhere around a million dollars in settlement money, and accidents like this are now extremely uncommon the warning systems obviously are doing their thing. They've even shut down that stretch of road a couple of times because of the warning systems, which honestly has probably saved quite a few lives. Mother Nature though, she is a bitch. Hello, true crimers. This is another worst freak accidents, and this one is one you have probably heard of before. You've likely seen the little animations about how this man died by a cow, so let me give you a brief explanation as to how it actually occurred. This was a Brazilian man by the name of João Maria da Souza. And back in July of 2013, he was asleep in his bed next to his wife. Now, a lot of people just make jokes about the next part saying the cow must have just fallen from the sky. But that's not what happened. I don't believe this is the exact roof. I'll show you that one in a second, but I wanted to give you a visual representation of what it was. So the roof of his home um, literally went directly into a hill. 
So anyone walking in this area or anything like a cow could easily just walk onto the roof. The cow had escaped from a nearby farm and it had wandered over to this man's house. When the cow stepped on the roof and the cow was roughly 3,000 pounds, it immediately gave in because it's not meant, you can tell, it's not really meant to support that kind of weight. So the cow crashed down and it landed on the side of the bed where Joao was sleeping. His wife and the cow were both fine, essentially uninjured. This was also an eight foot drop. So when it fell on Joao, it broke his leg. He was then taken to the hospital where then he would die a few hours later. And this was likely due to internal bleeding that was not able to be controlled. There are rumors that the hospital essentially let him sit there without being treated for quite some time, which is what led to the internal bleeding. The hospital, of course, has denied this. Unfortunately, there don't seem to be any updates on the story since he passed away in 2013. The last thing I could see was that the owner of the cow had not been identified at that point, and they're not even sure if charges could necessarily be pressed. This, this literally was just the definition of what a freak accident truly is. It's just genuinely super unfortunate and very sad. A lot of jokes are made at the expense of this man in videos I've seen about the cow falling on him. But this was a person who died very unexpectedly and in a very terrifying way. Let's show him and his wife a little respect. Some of the images you are about to see may be disturbing to some. Just wanted to give you a little viewer discretion is advised right from the get-go. Hello, true crimers. This is today's Christmas story. I cannot find the pronunciation of the name of this hotel like anywhere. My normal how to pronounce uh, thing doesn't have it. So I'm not going to try to say it. But pictured behind me was a hotel in Seoul, South Korea. It was a 22-story, 222-room luxury hotel. It was constructed and finished in 1969. But unfortunately, it would not have a very long lifespan. On Christmas Day, 1971, on the second-story coffee shop, a propane tank exploded. And literally, within 30 minutes, the entire building was engulfed. To me, this is one of the most frightening images. Like, just seeing how huge and billowing those smoke clouds are. Now, the biggest issue in this hotel was the fire escapes. Well, there wasn't very many of them. In fact, they only had two internal staircases in the entire building. They were designed to only use as a backup in case the elevator broke down. They were not designed to be actual fire escapes. So the way that the building was constructed, the staircases actually acted like a fireplace. In fact, both staircases were actually one of the first areas of the hotel to be completely filled with smoke. There was no external staircases, you know, no outside fire escapes. So people inside, understandably, panicked. They were trying to use helicopters to pick people up off the roof. There were reports of people trying to jump to the helicopter from the windows. People were hanging on to the ladders that were dropped from the helicopters. And unfortunately, some people lost their grip and they fell. The next few images might be disturbing. So just want to give you a heads up. People would begin to jump out of the building. And this happens commonly in fires like this. They wanted to take their chances. Some of them actually used mattresses to jump out of the building in hopes that that would sort of break their fall. It didn't. 38 people were confirmed to die simply from jumping out of the building. A man on a lower floor would actually throw his daughter out of a window for someone to catch, which I actually don't know if someone did or not. But Jesus, look at all that smoke too, Jesus. People were just waiting by the windows until the fire got to them before they would make a decision whether or not to jump. That has got to be absolutely terrifying. 164 people died that day. 63 more were injured. Eight people in connection with the hotel, like the construction people, the owners, they were all held criminally responsible, as they should have been. He would call it a party trick, one he had done many, many times. But this time, it was the last. Hello, true crimers. This is another worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised.
pictured here was Gary Hoy. Gary was a lawyer for the Holden Day Wilson Law Firm in Toronto, Canada. He was a corporate and securities lawyer. The law firm was very prestigious and they hosted many, you know, events. You know, they would have events for their clients and they would also hold events for incoming law students. On July 9th, 1983, which the law firm was located here in the Toronto Dominion Center, and it was on the 24th floor. Well, that day they were holding an event for incoming law students. It was a reception. Gary would always like to impress the new people in the building. He wanted to show how strong the windows of the building were. You know, he would always brag that the windows were shatterproof and they were, you know, very safe. So this party trick, as he called it, that he would do was whenever they were giving tours, he would throw himself against the window, slam his body against it. And this was to show that the window wouldn't shatter. He did this trick hundreds of times before, all to success. Until July 9th, 1993. That day, he did one tour where he slammed himself against the window and everything went according to plan. And then another tour came through and he wanted to show off his trick. So against the exact same window, he threw his body into it. The window did not shatter, but the window completely popped out of the frame. It would then collapse 24 floors to the ground, as would Gary Hoy. His forward momentum took him right past the window frame and he fell 24 floors to his death. The fall only took seconds and he would die on impact. Rumors that he was screaming all the way down aren't confirmed. There really isn't an explanation as to why all of a sudden it happened this time. That being said, this was a very reckless stunt one that should never be replicated. This story kind of became like urban legend and people were like, oh, this story can't be true, but it is. Mythbusters actually tested it out on one of their very first seasons. And I believe it was one of those like myth confirmed, it can happen kind of things. The story was featured in movies and, and it's very, very true. The law firm would end up going under a couple of years later. They couldn't escape the tragedy. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 37, and from now on, when I think of freak accidents, I'm thinking of this one. Viewer discretion is advised. On August 25th, 2010, an L-410 passenger aircraft would be on approach to land. It was approaching the Bandundu Airport in the Congo. Including the pilot and crew, there were 21 people on board. As the plane begins its descent, something insane happens. From one of the passengers' large bags, a fucking crocodile comes out. An actual, living, moving crocodile. It was smuggled on board. This is not a large aircraft. The passengers were like up close and personal with this thing. Naturally, they all become very reactive. They begin screaming. They begin to try to run from the thing, but they have nowhere to go. The crew panicked. Everyone was panicking. As the crew began to rush towards the cockpit to alert the pilot, all of the passengers do as well. The later investigation would uncover that the plane's center of gravity, it shifted like a major shift. And believe it or not, this caused the plane to go completely out of control. Again, not a large plane. The plane is now just hurling towards the runway and it does not land safely, it, it crashes. 20 of the 21 people aboard the plane that day, including the captain, died on impact. Amazingly, there was one survivor and that survivor is the one who told the investigators exactly what happened. The crocodile, believe it or not, survived. The crocodile would actually be killed once it was discovered. Um, they killed it with a machete. And I know people are gonna say, oh my God, why do you care so much about the animal? Because this crocodile did not ask to be smuggled onto a plane. The crocodile didn't know what it was doing. 
It obviously did not intentionally cause the plane to crash. It's a crocodile. <laughs> I feel awful for the 20 people that lost their lives that day. I mean, that is a terrifying way to go. But Christ, the animal survived. I'm sorry, but this is a situation where there was absolutely no reason to kill the animal. But again, this is like something from a movie. A snakes on a plane, you know? This is like the epitome, to me personally, of like what a freak accident really truly is. Absolutely terrifying. This is a worst freak accident that is very difficult to talk about and very difficult to hear. So I want to give you a fair warning that this one is about a child. And viewer discretion is advised. This was six-year-old Abigail Taylor of Minneapolis. In 2007, she was swimming in a public pool. Not this one pictured, but... She unknowingly sat down on a pool drain. A drain that was not properly equipped with the right safety aspects. The drain was essentially was sucking, you know, water in, and she got caught uh, in it. The suction was so powerful that it literally pulled her small intestines out of her body. It just eviscerated this poor girl. Other internal injuries also occurred with it. Now, she survived um, the initial incident. For nine months, she battled in the hospital. She was only able to be fed through a tube. Eventually, her liver would begin to fail. In December of 2006, she received a transplant of a new liver, um, bowel, and a pancreas. But then there were complications from the transplant. It actually led to her getting a cancer, which she then had to go through chemotherapy. But ultimately, in March of 2008, Abigail would succumb, and she passed away peacefully. The family filed a lawsuit against the club where the pool was located, and they also sued the manufacturer of the pool. Congress would then create much stricter guidelines and laws for pool safety. The family would settle for $8 million, all for a safety thing that would have cost, what, a hundred bucks to fix? And this never would have happened to this poor girl? It's just beyond tragic, and this never needed to happen. This may be the epitome of what a freak accident truly is. This is Worst Freak Accidents, number 44. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 21-year-old Margaret Maurer. She was a student of Tulane University. In 2019, her and a few of her friends were on a little road trip. At some point, they stopped here at a rest stop in Mississippi. And this is off the Interstate 10. Right around that same time, this 18-wheeler was going westbound on the 10. Margaret, who would go by Meg to her friends and family, she went to use the restroom and then she was walking out across the parking lot. Just literally seconds before this, one of the dual tires, which weigh about 500 pounds, flew off the truck and then it began to go across the freeway. It would roll over the median and then it hit two cars before entering the parking lot. And then that's when Meg was walking across, and then the tires, they came into contact with her. The 500-pound tires rolled about 850 feet before it struck her. And it was still going at enough speed that when it did hit her, it actually would kill her. She was killed immediately when the tires struck her, but nobody else in the area was injured. The tires falling off the truck was literally a freak accident. There was no wrongdoing on the driver's part. You know, Meg's family would just say, we want to be angry at someone, but we can't. This is something that just happened. Meg was just on the verge of graduating from Tulane. Meg was someone who absolutely loved science. As a matter of fact, she was pursuing a career in the field of scientific illustration. She loved nature. She loved being outdoors. She loved to travel abroad. Her family and friends just said she was a beautiful person inside and out. She was a very special person. She had an incredible future ahead of her. But sadly, all of that was cut short by one of the most bizarre freak accidents. 
which goes to show that <sighs> literally anything can happen. So just live life to the fullest. This to me is the very definition of freak accident. Hello, true crimers. This is another worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was Charmaine Maxwell. She was an R&B singer, um, a member of the group Brownstone from like the 90s. At the time of this story, she was living in Los Angeles, California. And in March of 2015, she was at home having a couple of glasses of wine, you know, to unwind for the day. Later that evening, her husband came home and unfortunately, he found her deceased on the back patio and there was just blood pooling from behind her head. What uh, police and the coroner was able to basically realize what happened was pretty wild. She had to have been drinking a glass of wine and then as she was going between outside to the patio from inside the house, she somehow slipped on something. The wine glass would fall out of her hand and it broke into shards on the ground. And this all happened before she hit the ground. So when, she, when the back of her head came in contact with the ground, it actually was impaled on a piece of glass from the wine glass. There were two separate shards of glass that were punctured into the back of her head and neck. It's unknown if she died from this instantaneously or if she bled out, uh, but the coroner does believe that she was rendered unconscious uh, pretty much immediately when she came in contact with the glass. You know, of course, they tried to investigate this possibly as some kind of foul play, but nothing like that was in the picture. She was home alone when this occurred and, you know, alibis were checked and all of that. This was a very insane freak accident. Dropping a wine glass, falling backwards and landing on that broken wine glass, that would kill you. That's that you probably couldn't even recreate that if you tried. Hello, true crimers. This is the tragic story of the ozone disco fire in the Philippines. The nightclub opened up in 1991 and was located in Quezon City off of Timog Avenue. It was a relatively small nightclub um, and the initial occupancy limit was like 35 to 40 people. But it was an instantly popular success, especially amongst young people and students. But on March 18th, 1996, a horrific tragedy would befall the Ozone Disco nightclub. At around 11.35 p.m. that night, a few sparks would hit the ceiling above the DJ's booth area, which was located near the kitchen and the bathrooms. Now, when this initially happened, a lot of the patrons saw it and said, oh, it's just some sort of special effect. It's part of the, you know, something they're doing here. And people just continue to party and dance. Now, a little bit earlier, I said that the occupancy was about 35 to 40 people. That was their limit. This particular evening, however, there were 350 patrons and roughly 40 employees of the nightclub packed into this building. The sparks quickly turned to a small fire that began to go slowly down towards the stage. The patrons who noticed the blaze, they began to run out of the building right away. The DJ who was there that night, his name was Marvin Reyes. He said he began to see people's hair catch on fire and clothing. He was trying to announce into the microphone, everyone get out, there's a fire, but then his microphone malfunctioned. And then suddenly it became complete and utter chaos. There was a second floor to the nightclub and there were security guards who were up there who did not understand what was going on yet. So when the chaos began to happen, they thought a riot was happening and they closed the doors to the upstairs um, area. And because the doors opened inward, everyone inside of there basically just became trapped. When they finally were able to open those doors, a backdraft happened, which blew back many of the patrons trying to escape. One person described that event as a tidal wave of heat. 
By the way, the images behind me are the aftermath of the fire to the disco. But now everyone's trying to get out, so then a stampede begins. And many people would eventually become trampled to death. Many people were lucky to escape, but they escaped with burns to their body. Permanent, lifelong scars. It took two hours for firefighters to put the entire fire out. Emergency exits were blocked by a building next door. Another emergency exit was locked by a security guard from the outside so no one could open the door. So there was no proper fire escape. 95 people were injured. 162 people died that night. The worst fire incident in the Philippines history. The building was eventually demolished and is now a fast food restaurant. Approximately 155 coffins, and not one person held responsible. Hello, true crimeers. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 42, the Capron Railway Disaster. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was the Gletscher Spawn 2. It was a funicular railway, and essentially it would carry passengers from Capron, which is in Austria, to the uh, Klitsteinhorn Mountain, and this was for skiing purposes. Now, they would be required to go through tunnels, and this is literally how narrow it was. Like, that looks extremely claustrophobic to me. On November 11th, 2000, 161 passengers and one conductor would board the funicular. It was a morning trip, and by all accounts, every single person there was just super excited to go skiing. The train would take off shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning, and the conductor was actually at the upper end of the train. Here at the other end of the train was this little electric fan heater. At some point after they took off, this little guy caught fire. It overheated and it actually burnt through the tubing and pipes that carry through the hydraulic fluid which controlled the brakes. They had then gone into basically that tunnel there at the other end and when they were about 600 meters in, all of those pipes and whatnot had officially burnt through, which triggered a safety system to stop the train. And it just so happened to stop it right in the middle of this tunnel. This is when those inside began to notice the fire. Because no one was up front where the fire had started, it was allowed to basically just keep going and it began to spread through the train. And then the fire just became huge. Now the passengers were trying to open up the doors, but the same piping and tubing and all that that burnt it also controlled those. By the time the conductor was able to get to the radio to call for help, it was too late. The radio had burned through as well. There was no accessible fire extinguishers in the train. There were no smoke alarms either. A significant flaw in this design. 12 passengers were able to break through the very thick acrylic glass towards the back and they were able to punch their way through. Those 12 people were the only ones to survive. By this time, smoke has completely filled up the train and people are passing out left and right. They had lost consciousness. It took hours for any rescuers to even get close to saving anyone. The remaining passengers managed to get themselves up towards the control center of the train, but there was no escape for them because the broken through glass was at the opposite end and all of them would end up dying. Smoke inhalation, burns. 155 people lost their lives. There is now a memorial for those victims. 16 people went on trial and they were all acquitted. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 49. Viewer discretion is advised. This was 55-year-old Lottie Michelle Belk and she lived in Chester, Virginia. Lottie worked in the mental health field and she also had served in the United States Army. She and her husband had two daughters and she was also a stepmother to her husband's uh, children from a previous marriage. On a warm June day in 2016 here on Virginia Beach, Lottie was out having some fun with her family and celebrating her birthday. The beach was crowded that day and it was also just filled with beach umbrellas. The beach umbrellas were anchored into their spots, uh, but apparently some of them were not anchored well enough. That day there was reportedly very strong winds, somewhere around 25 to 30 miles per hour, and those winds would end up picking up one of the umbrellas out of its anchor, I guess, and it began to hurl the umbrella down the beach. 
So that umbrella just so happened to fly through the air and then it struck and impaled Lottie directly in the chest and it hit where her heart was. When it hit her, she had gone down immediately and was unresponsive and the ambulance got there. They rushed her to the hospital, but unfortunately Lottie would end up succumbing to her injuries and she died. Because of Lottie's unfortunate accident, um, politicians there in Virginia have been making sure that there are safety regulations put in place for beaches and pools um, in terms of umbrella safety. This is one of those things you don't really think about, right? Uh, you know, you don't really think about an umbrella causing you any harm. But the reality is, is this has happened once, but it's also happened before. They can be a very dangerous weapon. It's almost like a javelin uh, if the winds are strong enough. From 2010 to 2018, there were roughly 2,800 beach umbrella related injuries, which some of those would eventually cause death. Most of them did not, but there was an incident where a man lost his eye and he was blinded by an umbrella. For Lottie's story, um, no foul play was suspected. They did look into what may have happened and possibly if someone forgot to anchor an umbrella, but nothing really came from that because honestly it was kind of impossible to know. So this would just go down as a very unfortunate freak accident, but hopefully moving forward, we can all learn from things like this. Rest in peace, Lottie. This is another worst freak accidents. Fewer discretion is strongly advised. This story takes place at a carnival in Omaha, Nebraska. In May of 2016, 11-year-old Elizabeth Gilreath was at this carnival with her friends and family. And little did she know the horror that she was about to face. Now, this is one of those pop-up local carnivals. Um, and at that carnival was a ride called King's Crown. I guess you get buckled in and it spins around. This is the image of Elizabeth just moments before this freak accident took place. And I don't know why it says 7-year-old right there, because she was definitely 11 when this happened. But you can see she is smiling, she's having a great time. And then she allegedly slipped out of her chair or possibly slumped down a little too low and her vibrant red hair got caught. And another viewer discretion advised trigger warning because the thing I'm about to say is very graphic. As her hair got tangled up in the ride, which was still spinning quickly, the force of the ride ripped her entire scalp off of her skull. Now, I cannot show you the images due to their graphic nature, but essentially we're talking from here all the way around and almost through her eye, completely ripped off. And it exposed her skull and there was some skull fracturing as well. And as this happened, her left eye was extremely damaged. Now, the ride operator was seen on camera running away from the scene. People assumed to get help, but for some reason, they didn't stop the ride first. So a friend of the family had to literally stop the ride manually. Now, Elizabeth says she barely remembers any of this happening, but she does remember and she told her mom, it felt like my head was being crushed and there was blood everywhere. I guess she did ask right afterwards, where's my pretty hair? Her mother described it as her daughter was literally being tortured for about five minutes because that's how long it took for the ride to finally stop. And she's just spinning around with her scalp being ripped off. Elizabeth survived. And behind me is a picture of her with her bandages on. So it's not graphic, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. So you can see the damage that it caused. But you know what? She survived. She is a fighter. One hell of a strong young woman. She spent a year having surgery after surgery after surgery, but ultimately she has managed to keep a very positive attitude. The family did file lawsuits, but I cannot find any updates on those. Millions of people around the country would watch live as seven space explorers would perish in one of the worst freak accidents. 
Hello, True Crimers. This edition of Worst Freak Accidents is about the Challenger explosion. Viewer discretion is advised. On January 28th, 1986, after several days of postponement, the Challenger space shuttle would finally lift off. The reason for the delays of the space shuttle taking off were because of the freezing cold temperatures. The primary concern was about the O-rings that were meant to seal in gases from expanding out, I believe. But the issue was the freezing cold temperatures of about 22 degrees on the day of the launch would possibly cause erosion in the O-rings. But they believed that it was good to go that morning. So these seven astronauts would board the shuttle. And they were Francis Scobie, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and teacher Krista McAuliffe. Krista was one of 11,000 applicants to join the astronauts into space. It was part of a program to launch the very first United States civilian into space. Back to the launch. Uh, it was the coldest temperature that NASA had ever experienced with a space shuttle launch. Now, the O-rings that I mentioned earlier, they were never tested before in super cold temperatures. As the shuttle launched, a plume of grayish black smoke, I'm not sure if you can see it, well, it would appear to be leaking out of one of the areas where the O-rings were, and this would be determined to be what caused the tanks to rupture. About 73 seconds after liftoff, and about 9 miles up, the space shuttle was torn apart. The engines had all hit a red line temperature limit, which caused them to shut down. The only record of the astronauts being aware of what was happening was when Mike Smith said, uh-oh, that was it. The left wing was shredded. The fuselage where the crew was was hurled in a different direction, all while spectators, including family members, were watching from the ground below. The horrified reactions of not only people there, but millions of people watching live at home would all witness this catastrophic disaster. And there was nothing that anyone could do. It is widely believed that the crew did not die at the explosion. In fact, they were alive the entire time. They essentially free fell about 12 miles before crashing into the Atlantic Ocean, which would then cause their death. It would be years before they ever launched another shuttle. And how terrifying would that be for that crew? It was very tragic. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 43. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was the port of Tianjin, which is in northern China. It is one of the largest shipping and container ports on Earth. At the port was the Ruhe International Logistics Company. At the port, they would store a massive amount of hazardous chemicals. This would include sodium cyanide, calcium carbide, and a very large amount of ammonium nitrate. At approximately 10.50 p.m. on August 12th, 2015, reports of small fires had broken out inside one of their warehouses. The fire had spread to where the ammonium nitrate was being stored, and this was about 3,000 tons. When firefighters arrived, they of course started to spray water. It is believed that the water had been sprayed over the calcium carbide, which actually would end up releasing a flammable gas. So a combination of kind of the fire plus the gas being released would create a very large explosion. Kind of what you saw in the beginning of the video. The first actual explosion occurred around 11.30 p.m. It was so powerful that it registered as a 2.3 magnitude earthquake. And the shockwave from this would actually damage a lot of buildings. The explosion was also equivalent to about 2.9 tons of TNT. 30 seconds after the first explosion, another bigger explosion occurred. This one would generate a nearly 3.0 seismic earthquake, equivalent to about 22 tons of TNT. This would send out a massive amount of like fireballs and they reached hundreds of feet into the air. This was also a very densely populated area. Luckily, the port itself wasn't super populated, but there were like housing areas right next to this port. 
This is some of the damage that was generated simply from the shock wave of the explosion. And this was in buildings like, you know, half a mile away. The shock wave just blew through glass windows and doors. There was also a car storage lot for several different dealers. And this is what the explosion did to the cars. It ripped through all of them and they all burned up. This is the crater that formed after the explosions. So again, this is kind of what it looked like as an aerial view before, and then this is afterwards. It looks like something from a Fallout video game. 17,000 housing units nearby were affected and damaged. The death toll was 173 people and 800 non-fatal injuries. Many people were tried and convicted, including the chairman of the company, and he was sentenced to death. Hello, true crimers. This is another worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured behind me is a hot air balloon, something I personally have never done and I probably never will, especially after this story, which takes place in Lockhart, Texas. On July 30th, 2016, 15 passengers and the pilot would board this hot air balloon. It took off from Fentress Air Park. The destination was unknown. It departed at 6.58 a.m. At 7.42 a.m., the hot air balloon crashed into some power lines. It then caught on fire and it began to fall quickly. It would ultimately crash land in a field nearby. Sadly, all 16 people who were on board, they died. The coroner's report would show that they died either of blunt force trauma, thermal burns, or smoke inhalation. And in some cases, it was a combination. The balloon was several hundred feet in the air, making survival a damn near impossibility. This was and is still the deadliest hot air balloon crash in United States history. So how did this happen? The pilot was a man by the name of Skip Nichols. Now, he was given communication that several hot air balloon pilots were not going to be taking off that particular morning due to extreme cloud coverage. But, he said, we'll find a hole and we'll go. It's believed he took the hot air balloon over the clouds and the fog, and then when he tried to lower it back down, the visibility was non-existent, and then they crashed right into the power lines. For the rest of the video, I'm going to show some photographs of some of the victims. It would be revealed later that Skip Nichols took medications for depression, for anxiety, for ADHD. At the time, it wasn't required for hot air balloon pilots to be medically cleared to fly them. After this incident, it now is. Because Skip Nichols' mental state should have prevented him from taking the balloon up. He also had a history of drug and alcohol issues. The FAA did not even know about his medical issues or his drug and alcohol problems. He had four previous convictions of drunk driving, in which he served two different prison sentences. So, a combination of the FAA not having the proper rules and guidelines in place to prevent pilots like this man from piloting a hot air balloon, and the pilot himself willingly putting everyone's lives in danger when every other hot air balloon pilot that day said no. Not only did he cost him his life, but the lives of 15 innocent people. A flying lawnmower would be responsible for the worst freak accident, number 39. Hello, true crimers. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here behind me was Shea Stadium circa 1979. On December 9th, 1979, the Jets were playing the Patriots. There were roughly 45,000 people in attendance that day and they would be treated to a popular uh, halftime event show. It was a model air show, and it wasn't just like model airplanes. It was like model airplanes, but like designed to look like other things. There would be like fun little competitions where like the planes would kind of fight each other or chase each other. This was a common event that was done a whole bunch of times before without incident. Well, this day, there would be an incident. One of the airplanes was modeled to look like a lawnmower. This particular day, they were flying these devices around the field, but they were also hovering dangerously close over the stands. 
A lot of spectators from that day would go on to say that they were very concerned, they were very nervous. Some people were beginning to like move towards the exits just in case they needed to run. Just moments before the show was ending, Philip Cushman, who was operating the lawnmower design, well, he lost control of it and it began to careen towards the stands. And it crashed about five rows up on the third base dugout side of the stadium. You know, when it was a baseball stadium and football stadium. The lawnmower hit two people. 25-year-old Kevin Rourke and 20-year-old John Bowen. Kevin had minor injuries to his head and was brought to the emergency room where he was released shortly after. Spectators who saw John Bowen get hit with the lawnmower said it looked like he had been hit with an axe. He had a giant gash in his head. He was rushed to the emergency room. He had to go through emergency surgery, but he did not pull through. He would end up dying four days later as a result of his injuries. There was an investigation put into place, but it was basically determined that this was really just a freak accident. Needless to say, this particular show wasn't really uh, sought after after this incident. I wonder why. This is another worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was the Alexander L. Keeland Flotel. Now, it was considered a Norwegian drilling rig, but it was never actually used for drilling. It was almost like a floating hotel, I guess you can say, and it was meant to house a bunch of offshore uh, personnel. And it was built to hold about 390 people. On March 27th, 1980, it was in the Ecofist oil field, which was in the North Sea. Earlier in the day, fog had come in and the weather was starting to get bad. Then it would turn into a pretty bad storm. It was so bad that if they needed rescuing, helicopters couldn't even fly in. There were about 212 souls on board when at 6 p.m. a very loud crack was heard. Then, 15 minutes later, a humongous boom. And then everyone on board began to feel the entire rig sway. Five of the six anchor cables just snapped off leaving only one to keep the entire rig from capsizing. But at 6.53 p.m., that final one snapped as well. Of the 212 people on the rig, 130 of them were either in the mess hall or the little cinema room they had. Attached to the rig were seven lifeboats that can each hold 50 people. They also had 20 rafts that can each hold 20 people. Only four of all of them got launched. The strain had become so tense that it wouldn't let them release the cables of the lifeboat. Within 20 minutes, the entire rig had completely flipped over and capsized. Over 100 people were sent into the freezing cold temperatures of the water. The temperature of the water that night was about 38 degrees. And the temperature of the air was only a few degrees warmer. And honestly, it seems to be really difficult to blame anyone for the lack of rescue because this all happened within like a 20 minute time frame. It happened so fast that most of the men could not even get their life jackets. Only eight of those people managed to actually have a life vest on. Four of those people died. The remaining lifeboats were then either crushed by waves or they sank. Of the 212 people on board, only 89 of them would survive. 123 people died in the freezing cold waters that night. Most of them would likely die from drowning or hypothermia, a combination of both, and some likely died from blunt force trauma from being thrown around the rig. The disaster would help show weaknesses of these rigs, and new safety measures were put in place. Eventually, it got flipped back into place where it was then dismantled. Imagine one million pounds of logs collapsing in on you. Hello, true crimers. This is another worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. For a little over 90 years or so, it was a tradition at Texas A&M to build a bonfire and burn it. And typically at the very top, they would put something uh, to do with their rivals. And their rivals were the University of Texas. 
The bonfire symbolizes um, their burning desire to beat the shit out of what they called TU. It was really just a big, like, you know, pump everyone up celebration for the football game that would be coming up against the school. Now, the how they stacked it over the years has changed, um, but towards the end, they went with what they called the wedding cake design. They put a big pole down the middle, and then around it, they stack layer after layer of these massive logs. They would then have, like, wires sort of, kind of like a TP almost, and then they would have wires connecting all of the, uh, the logs together. Now, in 1994, they had a pretty severe mishap, but nobody was hurt and nobody died in this situation, but it leaned over, as you can see. By the way, the students call themselves Aggies, so this was named the Aggie Bonfire. On November 18th, 1999, they were in the process of building this structure. It was going to be roughly 60 feet tall, and it consisted of over 5,000 logs. The bottom, like, two layers of logs would weigh roughly a million pounds. At approximately 2.42 a.m., students would recall hearing a very loud pop and a crack like a door opening in a haunted house is how they would describe it. And then the entire structure collapsed over to one side. There were people inside the structure and there were people obviously all around it because they were in the process of building it. But we're talking now over a million pounds of logs that just collapsed all at one time. This is kind of a chart they made um, of the structure and like where people were. There would be 27 people who were severely injured and 12 people were crushed to death underneath the logs. Some of these people died after waiting long periods of time under these logs because rescue was very difficult. They had to make sure that if they weren't like moving a log that the structure wouldn't collapse more and hurt or kill more people. So unfortunately there were people who were stuck and alive but eventually would succumb and they died. The rescue operation took over 24 hours. They have since built this memorial for those that were lost. This traditional bonfire was then banished by the school, but students have continued the tradition off campus. Best not f with the Arizona desert because she could be a real bitch. Hello, true crimers. This is Worst Freak Accidents number 45. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a story that takes place back in 1982, and unfortunately, I cannot find a photo of the victim. But this is one of those freak accidents that could have really easily been avoided. The Arizona desert is cold, and it's gorgeous. It is full of some of the most beautiful wildlife and some of the most stunning scenery you'll ever see. Some of that includes multiple types of cacti. For example, this is something called jumping cactus. Do you know what it does? It jumps on you. Yeah. If you get close enough, it'll literally pop off and it'll just stick right into your skin. I have experienced this myself. It sucks. And they really dig in deep. It's, it's painful. Here's an example of someone who probably thought they could fight a cactus. Well, guess who won? Yes, this is a real photo because this kind of thing happens all the time here. But this story, it's pretty unique. In 1982, a man by the name of David Grudman decided to go out into the Arizona desert with a shotgun. And he came across some saguaro cacti. These can be humongous. And these are the ones you typically see with all sorts of different branched out arms. Look at this goofy looking one, yeah? Well, you see, David decided he wanted to take his shotgun and shoot at some of these. He shot a small one and little limbs fell off and fell to the ground. Ha ha ha. Oh, it's fun. But then he decided he wanted to go battle with a 25-foot saguaro. He shot towards the trunk of the cactus, and guess what? It fell over. Also, guess what? He didn't get out of the way. The entire upper half of the saguaro cactus collapsed on top of David and pinned him to the ground. He was then impaled by many, many, many needles. These can also be extremely heavy. Just one foot of a piece of one of these can actually weigh somewhere around 90 pounds. And he was hit by at least four or five feet. So not only was he being stabbed by all of the needles, he was also being crushed. 
and David Grunman would die there in the desert, pinned by a cactus. Perhaps fucking Mother Earth is not the best suggestion for those in the future who decide to shoot a giant cactus.